I'm Paul Levinson, and welcome to Light On, Light Through, episode 345, my review of Harry and Meghan on Netflix. Well, let's start with the first three episodes of this documentary put together by Liz Garbus. And let me say, I'm not so much a royal watcher as a lifelong student of media, As some of you may know, I'm a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University. And so it was through that lens that I watched and really enjoyed the first three of six episodes of the Harry and Meghan documentary on Netflix. Now, Meghan is unique among the royals for several reasons. The most interesting and important, I'd say, in the long run, is that she was already a success in the media before she met Harry. Although Suits on the USA Network isn't quite up there with L.A. Law or Petricelli, the legal drama ran for nine seasons, and Megan played a major role as Rachel in seven of those seasons. This means that Megan has a comfort with media, an understanding of its levers, its challenges, its opportunities that few people on the face of the earth have, including the other royals. It shows in Liz Garbus's excellent documentary. Megan is sparklingly articulate, in control of every scene except when she wants to appear not so, and she knows just how to catch and look at the camera and us, her audience. This is not to say she's feigning emotions. She was convincing to me, though then again, I, of course, don't really know her. Prince Harry no doubt benefits from his wife's media insight. He also comes across as real and relaxed, and when he's upset and not relaxed at all, that seems thoroughly justified. Again, I don't really know Harry, so I can't say what he's like off camera, but certainly his concern for Megan's well-being and very life, in view, of course, of what happened to Harry's mother, Diana, well, that seemed 100% warranted. So the documentary brings home Harry and Meghan as a refreshingly real and therefore relatable couple. As a significant comparison, Harry's older brother and heir to the throne, Prince William, and his wife, Kate, are also shown from time to time in these first three hours. They seem nice and friendly enough, but on a different planet, compared to Harry and Meghan in the way they relate to the world. I suppose part of this is understandable, given the weight on William's shoulders as future king. But part of this also comes from their personalities, and neither one having anything like Meghan's facility with the media. Other than Harry and Meghan, per se, I thought the most commanding part of this first part of the documentary came from historian and filmmaker David Olusoga, whose critical take on the British Commonwealth was a splash of icy cold water for any who romanticized the biggest empire that ever existed in our world the underside of bringing civilization to so many diverse places is the price that people of color are still paying for this achievement. But there's a lot more to Harry and Meghan's story. We're advised at the beginning of the documentary, the filming concluded in August 2022, or prior to the end of Queen Elizabeth II's long reign on September 8th. 2022. There was a walkabout in Windsor shortly after, with William and Kate and Harry and Meghan meeting and greeting the people. 
It was a memorable and very heartening event, I thought. I watched it, of course, on television. For whatever reason, the two couples spoke to the people separately, however, on opposing sides of the street, and there wasn't much interaction between them. Harry and Meghan, of course, were fully aware of the documentary and the story it would tell, which, of course, was not yet up on Netflix. William and Kate must have known about the documentary, but it's not clear if they'd seen it. Probably not. Let's get to the final three episodes, four to six, of Harry and Meghan. And I said in my review of the first three episodes that this documentary by Liz Garbus on Netflix was really excellent, and I was more interested in the media aspects of the story of Harry and Meghan than the royalty per se, though of course the two are intertwined. The same is true of the final three episodes, four to six. But the media play a very different role in this part of their story. In the first part, we see Megan in control and on top of the media, able to use them to her and Harry's advantage, and good for her, I say. Now, however, in the concluding three episodes, we see Megan become the victim of their incessant intrusion, their incessant, that is, the media's incessant intrusion into their lives, to the point that she and Harry and their son and daughter need to go into some kind of hiding. Tyler Perry, the rich American actor who gave them shelter and peace in his beautiful home in California, well, he deserves a lot of credit and becomes a real hero in this story. And a shout out to Chris Boozy for providing some savvy research which shows that the avalanche of vicious tweets aimed at Megan were the work of a small group of well-organized racists. Both Harry and Meghan, of course, are understandably focused on what happened to Harry's mother, Diana, and making sure Meghan doesn't suffer anything close to the same fate. I would say that the ultimate culprit, by the way, in both cases, as far as Harry and Meghan are concerned, and back then in the 1990s, in both cases, the ultimate culprit is fame itself. When you don't have it, you pursue it relentlessly and often desire it above all else. But when you have attained it, especially if it's a lot of fame, it suddenly is pursuing you. And your task changes from seeking it to avoiding it. The problem is that fame unleashed becomes incompatible with basic human privacy. And here the royals do come into play. Whatever we may think of them, they have figured out a way of dealing with the flames of fame, including keeping it at bay when necessary. And their corporate-like decisions may rankle, and they certainly did bother both Harry and Meghan, but the firm's endless decisions the firm is what the overall organization of what is behind and around the royals is referred to. Well, their endless decisions on what information to dole out to the public, precisely where and when, were and are designed to give the media what they want in a way that doesn't burn or singe any member of the royal family or, of course, the concept of royalty itself. Ironically, the very forces that drove Harry and Meghan to leave the royals, the decision being more Harry's and being made to protect Meghan, well, it left them even more vulnerable to the media sharks. Why the royals didn't do more to protect Harry and Meghan, even then, after they had left the royals, well, that remains an open question and an indictment of the royal family. 
After all, Harry and Meghan were and are members of their family, literally, as are their children, aren't they? Prince William's responses, I thought in particular, don't show him in a very good light in this documentary, though in all fairness, the documentary doesn't show or purport to show his side of this complex story. But life does go on, and now that Charles is king and William is next in line to be king, there could well be time and occasion for a rapprochement between the brothers and the family. None of that is talked about in the documentary because its story concludes with Elizabeth II still on the throne. But it does lead us to believe, or at least it does me, that Harry and Meghan are good, thoughtful people, wonderful parents, and they and their children certainly deserve a happy life. And I hope you enjoyed this review of the documentary Harry and Meghan on Netflix. It's now close to the end of the year. I'll try to be back here soon before the year ends with some more episodes of Light On, Light Through and some of the reviews of the various shows that are on television. There are a lot of excellent new shows. In the meantime, stay safe, stay sound, and keep doing whatever you can to help those brave people of Ukraine get those fascist Russians out of their country once and for all. The Light on Light Through podcast. Athens, 2042 AD. She ripped the paper in half, then ripped the halves, then ripped what was left again into bits and pieces of history that could have been. Sierra Waters had read once that, years ago, it was thought that men made love for the thrill, while women made love for the sense of connection it gave them. Curled up with a good book says, Sierra Waters is sexy as hell. You can find out more about The Plot to Save Socrates by Paul Levinson at theplottosavesocrates.com. Paul Levinson still codes about an ancient biotech war raging on in secret for centuries.